Our next speaker is Reshma Biniwali, my partner, who I'm lucky to have joined. Uh, Reshma completed medical school in India, uh, then did a general surgery residency at the University of Massachusetts, followed by cardiac training in New York City, Montefiore, and did congenital training in CHLA and here in Los Angeles, and then transplant training at UCLA, and she's been a member of the staff for quite a number of years and has quite a broad skill set, uh, including doing some of these very challenging transplants. Reshma. Thank you, Dr. Van Arstel, and thank you, Dr. Appelhausen, for having me here to speak. And I'd also like to thank Kelly's family and Kelly herself for making all this possible today. Kelly was amazing. She saw our patients, our new patients on the list after their surgery. She encouraged them. I would see her in Maddie's room. Amazing person, amazing family. Thank you very much. Um, most of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having this session, uh, having me speak after the coffee break and not the lunch break as I'm usually used to. Um, and uh, my topic here is mainly a surgical topic. Uh, I have, unfortunately, no financial disclosures. Um, we've already talked about the preoperative management uh, of these patients. I'm going to focus on the intraoperative management, and then we're going to be discussing the postoperative management with some of our anesthesia colleagues. So as we know from the ICHLT data, congenital heart disease is a small fraction of uh, heart transplants, uh, which has grown by a one whole percent since uh, the last decade. The survival in the first year for these patients is much lower, if you look at the yellow curve, uh, than the other um, diagnosis. However, after 10 years, the congenital patients actually take over in terms of survival and have the best survival as compared to any other cohort. The pomivasc resistance in these patients is also um, being considered a factor in terms of their outcomes. However, uh, these are not significant in the long run. And their antibodies, or the PRAs as we call them, um, also do not impact their long-term outcomes because we have excellent programs. Um, the, for instance, the ones that uh, Dr. Cruz leads here with the desensitization therapies that prevent um, adverse outcomes. I just want to highlight the fact that UCLA has, uh, from the SRTR data, is the number one transplant, solid organ transplant center in the United States, having done 710 transplants of all donor types, uh, 585 disease donors, 125 living donors. Uh, obviously, these are um, not heart living donors yet. We are developing our DCD protocol, and that it's just in a fledgling state. So what are the prognostic factors in congenital um, cardiomyopathy or congenital heart disease? I already mentioned the pulmonary resistance. Um, again, there is a cutoff uh, that is a flexible cutoff. Uh, we've been playing with the pulmonary vasodilators and immunomodulators to help bring this down. The incidence of right heart failure is associated with more than 15% mortality. So single ventricle function, and um, later on I'll describe um, the atrial ventricle valve uh, function is one of the most important factors uh, in terms of outcome. The uh, physiologic reserve is also important. Their uh, albumin is one of the first things that we ask about. Uh, do they have enough reserve going into the surgery? This is a Fontan model that we had used in an animal study, um, which I think um, earlier speakers have spoken about. We used a Jarvik, or created a Fontan model, model using uh, Gore-Tex and um, uh, Dacron conduits. And we actually showed that um, this, um, the Jarvik can be implanted successfully in a Fontan circulation and in the face of increased pulmonary vascular resistance. Looking at the Intermax study, um, outcomes following implantation of mechanical circulatory support in adults uh, with congenital heart disease, it, they actually showed that ACHD patients with assist devices have similar survival compared to non-ACHD. However, all these patients were much younger, and they were more likely to undergo the device as a bridge to transplant, being younger, um, rather than a destination therapy. 
Um, also, these patients were much sicker compared to um, patients with dilated cardiomyopathy or ischemic cardiomyopathy on assist devices, uh, simply because I think we have a higher bar to cross when we think about trans um, implanting an assist device in a congenital patient, especially um, with a single ventricle physiology. So what are the risk factors for death um, uh, in single ventricle physiology uh, following heart transplantation? Um, as I mentioned earlier, systemic ventricular dysfunction um, is the most important um, uh, parameter that is looked at, and as well as atrioventricular valve regurgitation. This is recent uh, data from the J uh, Journal of Heart Lung Transplantation in July 2019, uh, where they found that the patients, um, other risk factors such as RV-dependent coronary circulation or uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, arrhythmias, pulmonary atresia, or any other uh, pulmonary atrovenous malformations were not as predictive of death uh, as was well, single ventricle dysfunction and valve regurgitation. So I think that's an important take home message here. So how do you prepare for a Fontaine heart transplant as a surgeon? <laughs> um, we need our tools and uh, we need a whole armamentarium of them. We have a special saws. I'm sure my friends here in the back from the OR will recognize the special redo saws. Again, I have uh, no affiliation with these companies, unfortunately. Um, we also use a device called the Aquamantis, which is, I, I think it's like the, the laser from Star Wars. It stops all the bleeding, um, and it's uh, magical because it doesn't char. And then lastly, but not least importantly, you need to be prepared. So selection of the candidate, we've all talked about, but I want to talk a, about a little bit about donor selection. It's really important to have a young, healthy donor. So our usual cutoff for donors is about 40 years and even younger. Um, depending upon the age of the recipient, we usually add 20 years and that's it. Uh, but we do not accept donors over the age of 40 um, as far as possible. The, there is always a donor recipient size mismatch because if you think about it, you're putting two ventricles in the patient who had a single ventricle. Yes, that single ventricle could be dilated, but most often times um, it's uh, the Fontan circuit or the right atrium that's dilated and the ventricle itself is small. It's really important um, to have adequate length of great vessels and I'll show you why. Um, so there's several challenges when you think about donor recipient size mismatch. How do you put that big heart into that small space in the chest? How do you um, make that new right ventricle get used to the high volume uh, from all the blood in the collaterals in these candidates? Uh, how about the high Fontan pressures affecting the liver and the, the bleeding and the coagulopathy that goes with it? So this is a big challenge. Sometimes we've had to op uh, leave chests open. Sometimes we've had to do delayed sternal closure with the help of plastic surgery, um, especially in patients who, um, with heterotaxy and uh, uh, systemic venous connections that are um, not standard. Um, again, uh, reconstructions, uh, which I'll go into the details of this, uh, taking down the Fontan circuit, um, assessing the aortic arch. These are all surprises. Um, you never know what you're going to run into. Um, oftentimes, there's CT scans from outside hospitals and um, you know some past remote history of surgery that was done in Germany or Iran or something. And uh, you go in there, and just like the video on your iPhone uh, today, the drone showing the shark right under the waters, um, you get into something that you was unexpected. So all this needs to be mapped, and mapping is critical, including um, chest wall distances, collaterals, and groin access. So sternal distance. Uh, what sternal distance? <laughs> There's uh, pretty much most of these hearts are huge and they're plastered to the sternum. So there is, it's inevitable that we would get into some part of the heart, even with the most careful dissection. It's just how you can limit this and how you can control this. Midline infia vena cava with the LSVC, 
use my pointer here. So here you see the vena cava is right in the middle. This is the heart, again, plastered the sternum. Uh, we had to do a reconstruction of the left SVC coming down to the vena cava in the midline, and then we stented it later on. Uh, this um, IVC is very challenging, um, especially in a patient with dextrocardia. You can see how the heart is uh, rotated to the right, and you see the great vessels um, are opposite. So the pulmonary artery is on the right, the aorta is to the left, and the SVC. Um, so Dr. Huddleston's group are, uh, has uh, shown us some new techniques of approaching this, where you actually divide the interatrial septum and dissect the Waterston's groove to create a sort of a partial sending into the neo left atrium of the donor, and then um, use that as the anastomotic site for your transplant so that the final result looks like this. Um, anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. Now, a lot of these kids are born with total uh, anomalous pulmonary veins, and you can see here, this is the common pulmonary venous chamber. So what, what can be done here is use the common atrium to become the new left atrium and use that to anastomose your new heart too. Um, when you have malposed great vessels, such as in congenitally transposed uh, great arteries uh, or uh, just leave a malposition of the aorta, um, we have to move the ostium of the pulmonary artery um, towards the left, where you can see here the new uh, ostium where the implanted uh, donor heart's going into is off to the less left as compared to prior. And then um, here you can see, I don't know, the, the close-up on the right side actually shows you the stents in the pulmonary artery, and sometimes they stents in the uh, interatrial septum. Uh, you can see how huge the hearts are, and this is a huge challenge because you have to cut across the stent and patch it through and through, recreate the pulmonary arteries all the way to the hilum. And so this is uh, a lot of work which has to be done before the donor organ arrives, which is, uh, you're fighting for time there, um, ischemic time of the heart. Um, in addition to that, you have to battle um, a lot of other uh, things like the reentry stenotomy that we talked about. Um, there are some difficult cases where you need to reconstruct a left-sided SVC, and in that case, um, you can use the donor innominate artery, which you can hook up to the left SVC, or you can use a conduit between the, the, the two right and left SVCs. Um, the picture CT scan on the right is of a patient of ours with the left SVC who we reconstructed using a PTFE conduit uh, and anastomosed it to the an IVC anastomosis, uh, which we stented open uh, in order to allow uh, free drainage. Um, this patient was also a heterotaxy patient. Um, some of the other novel ways of uh, hooking up the bilateral SVCs uh, can be by actually dividing the pulmonary arteries. The native pulmonary arteries of the patient are, div is, are divided, uh, leaving the left SVC and the right SVC connected to the native pulmonary arteries, and then using donor descending thoracic aorta as an interposition graft to recreate a, a confluence into which the pulmonary artery of the donor is now implanted. So this is very complex, and I'm not sure a lot of centers are doing this because of the concerns about this interposition graph, which uh, probably does not grow with the patient, so probably would not be useful in an adult. And then collaterals. I think we've talked about them ad nauseum, but they're there, uh, just like that shark. Um, so uh, the aortic arch reconstruction and the damus can, can be challenging uh, in an infant, but in an adult, this is already done. It's past history. So how do you recreate a normal aortic arch out of, uh, a, say, a damus where the pulmonary artery is anastomosed to the underside of the aorta? So that requires uh, some, some imagination and uh, reconstruction. And all this, like I said, has to be done before the heart arrives. So we looked at our heterotaxy patients with complex venous reconstructions. Um, and uh, this data was presented at the ISHLT in 2015. We looked at our patients um, over the last uh, decade, um, actually uh, 1990 to 2010, and we found that the outcomes in terms of survival were identical in uh, comparison to patients, um, non-heterotaxy patients. Um, again, I think that goes to say uh, a lot about the ex um, experience of the center, Dr. Lax's experience with these patients, and the, the ability to uh, reconstruct these um, uh, great vessels without uh, obstruction. 
I'm going to skip, skip this slide because we've already talked about it. So what are the failed Fontan physiological challenges? Um, I think we're going to talk about that in the next section. So I will keep focusing on the heart, uh, surgical part and come to heart liver transplantation, um, especially on block where you take the heart and the liver as one block and transplant it into a patient. It's important in, uh, immuno because it's immunogenetically benef beneficial. Uh, it decreases the cold ischemia for the liver and the need for blood transfusion and products. Also, in these patients with the heterotraxy, especially midline IVC, it can be a good um, salvage. So <clears throat> we started uh, our first on-block uh, experience, and I know there's certain first people in the audience here who we might recognize, Dr. Kaldas on the left. Uh, we have uh, Paul Chamnang, who does all our heart livers. Um, we were configuring how we would put two retractors in at the same time. It is a challenge uh, because you have the big omni. Uh, you can see the subject on the table is one of our ex-transplant fellows who uh, is still trying to come back to UCLA, Manny Casares. But um, the omni and the mors and the or the ankeny are mutually exclusive, so it's extremely difficult to configure this. Um, and we spent a good uh, whole day in the OR trying to figure this out. Um, and uh, try to um, emulate the Stanford experience, which was first published in 2012, uh, where they perform on-block heart liver uh, transplantations with good results. So what are the uh, main uh, takeaway points about the combined heart livers? Uh, it's a simultaneous incision. You have to do a femoral uh, exposure. There are adhesions not just in the chest, but also in the belly because of peritonitis and infected taps. Uh, the bypass strategy is venoarterial bypass. And the sequence of organ transplantation is heart um, followed by liver on venoarterial bypass, or if it's on block, it's a simultaneous implant with the left atrium being sutured first and then both organs simultaneously. Um, these uh, guidelines have been published recently in the 2019 edition of the Dumont UCLA Transplant Guide of the fourth edition, um, presented by Dr. Boo Sutil. So the short -term outcomes of on-block heart liver have recently been present, uh, published um, in clinical transplantation this year, uh, where they show that uh, they have excellent outcomes, uh, even um, two and uh, four years after the heart liver transplantations. Um, again, um, the, their techniques are similar to ours, where the recipient cardiectomy and hepatectomy are on bypass and followed by a very careful volume management and inotrope management following the heart liver transplant. So when all this is uh, said and done, you have that bloody field in the happy heart in a very, um, uh, I would say, ravaged chest, but uh, it's, it's, very, uh, it's a big relief and it's uh, very um, rewarding to see this uh, heart um, in an in a isotopic and uh, good physiologic state. Thank you very much.